one of the efficient ways of potentially designing this if you assume maybe it was designed uh, on a on software or on some form of computer that you could design half the face and then mirror it and you know you've got the uh, you've got the other half of the face there and then this gets executed in some manufacturing system so ben from uncharted x who has been on joe rogan he's been on flagrant recently released a new presentation that's about like over two and a half hours long i watched like an hour of it and there's a lot of interesting things that you said and uh, yeah i would like to provide my opinion on that and i would like to provide my opinion on his opinion <laughs> before we get into it just quickly if you are not subscribed and you are part of this 98 point like six or eight percent I would appreciate it if you click that subscribe button um, or just pressing a like on this video. I would super appreciate it. More videos like this are also coming soon. So clicking that bell will get you notified when a brand new video is just being released. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, despite what I think a lot of people might think about my work, I don't just say like everything is magical, mystical kind of out of place artifact. I'm actually quite careful uh, to say what I think can and can't be done by the dynastic Egyptians because one thing... And it's this is something that my good friend Yusuf Awen says a lot is that you never want to underestimate the dynastic Egyptians. They were a, an amazing civilization, three thousand years at the height of their power and wealth. They had just tremendous capability, and they built, you know, a lot of the temples that we see at Karnak. A lot of the the work there, not all of it, I think, and you know, we'll get into that. But you know, they had tremendous capability, and they achieved a whole lot. But there are a number of things that are really out of their reach from a technological perspective that show characteristics of sophistication, precision machining, things like this, that, that really don't match up with what we know about that civilization. Now, the point that you and Yomi argue quite a bit in this video is, how do you know, like, how does Ben know that it was out of their reach? Especially in the old kingdom, right? Like, that's a period we know very little about. We know a lot about it in relation to it being so long ago. But Ben's going to discuss the characteristics that he thinks qualifies for this ancient advanced machining that he claims is necessary for a lot of these artifacts in ancient Egypt. The first category that I, I kind of put these things into or that I look for uh, is really that of machining, evidence for machining, particularly in the unfinished work that we can see in artifacts and architecture uh, all around Egypt. And this, to some extent, also does show us the value of unfinished work when we find it. But in a, a few locations, you can find unfinished work and the witness marks and signatures of what seem to be very powerful tools that have been used into some very hard stone. Right here, we can see examples for things like circular saws, straight saws, very powerful tubular drills. We'll get into that topic a little bit more later on. You know, these are things that, that might not be immediately obvious to, say, an, an archaeologist who isn't, who isn't trained or has a background in machining, but they do pop out to people that use tools like these, that, that leave marks like these, that to, they're obvious to people who work in these materials. So I'm talking about engineers, you know, construction experts, stonemasons, people like that. Uh, and those are the people that typically get excited and, and do a lot of work and investigation into these realms of, you know, witness marks on, on ancient Egyptian artifacts. It's guys like Christopher Dunn, who was a, you know, manufacturing expert, manufacturing engineer for more than 40 years. A couple of the examples here, in fact, were pointed out and discussed by such people like that who have been on tours with me. By the way, guys, I do tours. I do tours. Okay, but besides that tour joke, he also mentions Christopher Dunn. I never used to mind Christopher Dunn. Uh, I never really knew too much about him besides the fact that, you know, he's the author of the book. I think it's the Keys of Power Plant Theory. Uh, and he has showed up also on Joe Rogan. I'm pretty sure I might be wrong about that. Now, Christopher Dunn also recently appeared on Ancient Prisons podcast. I can't remember exactly what the podcast is called, but I'll leave a link to that podcast in the description down below. I definitely want to break it down as well. I don't want to get into that here, but if you want to check it out, I will leave a link to it in the description down below. And also, you should definitely check out Ancient Presence channel if you're watching this video, because, I mean, you're definitely into this type of stuff. All those types of things and still had problems with his hands. And these days, I believe he does a lot of his sculpting with, uh, you know, programmable 3D, you know, CNC machines like five axis mills. So you program the shape you want on a computer and a robot essentially does the work into the stone for you. So he's an expert in all forms of machining into stone. He's spent years doing each of these different levels of machining and when he saw this he pointed it out to us because I'd, I'd seen this box a number of times and I hadn't really noticed this unfinished faceted bullnose and he was blown away by it and said look this is definitely not the result of something that you would 
you would do with a hand tool. This is not, you know, a chisel's not going to do this. You're not going to get this from polishing. And again, it's not the intended result. Like this is literally the result of a tool that was run along this thing, creating these facets that's really shaping that stone and giving it that, um, you know, that faceted shape. So it's definitely not a hand tool. We don't know what made it, but we can see the witness mark from the tool. I love how this guy, like outside of Egyptology, just coming in, he's like definitely not a hand tool. But I mean, I completely understand that. And probably agree with it most likely fucking agree with that actually like it probably wasn't a hand tool um the fact that you know egyptologists say it's a hand tool is kind of weird um but again we haven't found uh anything else so it's like i i i mean what else do they have to say you know we, they can't say something that we haven't found but it is clear that the egyptians had all sorts of carving methods um whether it's using huge swords circular swords um you know just regular hand tools so I completely agree with Ben here that there is something missing from the archaeological record. And I also agree with that other guy that's like, yo, this probably wasn't done with hand tools. But again, where I disagree with Ben is, I mean, you will see it later in the video. You will hear about it later in the video. For example, there's been recently a, a number of interesting artifacts that have come out of Turkey. There was a portion of a, of a polished obsidian bracelet that was found in central anatolia in turkey you can see an image of what it would have looked like as a whole piece here and then you can see the fragment of it that's been analyzed here now this is obsidian there's a piece of it and it's very evident that this bracelet or this fragment of this obsidian bracelet was in fact turned and the interesting part about this bracelet is that it, it's come from a site that's been you know carbon 14 dated to the period of around 8300 to 7500 bc so like around 10,000 years old if not if not older. But in order to get a smooth surface like this, and it, you, know, you can see from this paper, it includes microscopic analysis of the actual surfaces. You have to, you, you really have to turn it and you have to be very gentle with it because otherwise you'll, you'll snap pieces off of the obsidian. And really the only way to achieve a shape like this is if it was turned uh, and turned at a relatively high speed. And that's really the conclusion that this paper comes to about this bracelet. And so it's, it's another out of place artifact relative to all of the other kind of stone age obsidian work that we can see and so to get obsidian this smooth and you know this um this clean particularly in these grooves it's a hundred percent the result of a pretty sophisticated um lathe that was used i needed to play that clip fully because this artifact is crazy outstanding like it's crazy that we have this it's crazy that we found this this is 8,000 to, I guess, 7,000 to 8,000 BC, which is close to 10,000 years ago. And to have an artifact that looks this precisely designed, this smoothly designed, this symmetrical, as Ben pointed out, the obsidian is hard to carve um, because one slight error and you could literally make a huge chip. So he's saying that it was probably uh, designed with a high speed tool. And, you know, I'm not going to disagree with that. If the scientific paper you know, claims, yo, this was probably designed with some sort of high speed tool. I'm not going to disagree with it. The, the, I guess where I would disagree is like how high speed was the tool? Um, what type of, like, what are you implying? I guess, um, because if you are implying that 7,000 to 8,000 BC, there is, there was technology that was lost. I don't disagree with you. I mean, this proves it. If this artifact was dated to that time period, you know, and it looks like that. I mean, you know, that it is what it is. It was made in that time period, right? But then what I would say to that is, yes, there is technological evidence missing from the archaeological timeline. You know, we don't know a lot of things. Just, just because we don't know doesn't mean we do know also. So it's like, you know, who knows how this could have been made? And it doesn't mean that they had computers, right, with software. You know, this could have been made any other ancient way um, that was just lost to time. Uh, a lot of time, by the way, a lot of time. There's a kind of a, a meta point about precision that I think applies to a lot of this stuff, in particular the boxes and vases. And that's that, you know, precision isn't really ever developed for any other reason than the pursuit of function. There's an absolute relationship between precision and function. So this is the part of the video where Ben and I, I mean, we've basically been agreeing and disagreeing uh, throughout the video but here is where it's at its strongest because because Ben sticks to the idea that these highly symmetrical and detailed 
and hard to produce objects have to be a result of function and I agree with him right it did have a function to the ancient Egyptians that's not good enough for Ben he talks like they didn't have a function to the ancient Egyptians dog humans have put effort into religious monuments throughout history in my opinion if you look at these objects I'm not surprised that the Egyptians put so much detail so much effort into crafting just like you know one head for example because it's monumentally important it's monumentally needed to them now I might be making a lot of assumptions but in my head I'm being fair precision in the modern world really started with the the need for naval cannons to shoot straight what bro i'm sure precision has always been around if there is a necessity for something to be precise i'm sure humans have always made it as precise as they could i'm sure now ben now ben's probably talking about like the like most precise precise but i'm sure humans have always tried to do that we just you know we just over time gain more technological ability to do it even more precise and then in the kind of more modern world, we, we know that precision really started to develop, particularly around the industrial age. Things like steam engines, you had to you know create pressure vessels that could contain uh, pressurized steam. So you needed to have flat surfaces. You know, today we have these you know nanometer processes and we're packing in millions of transistors into these integrated circuits that are the, just tiny. And, and you do that and it costs billions of dollars to achieve that. But we do that in order to gain the functional benefit of just a tiny power footprint and the efficiency of what you can do with uh, those types of integrated circuits. So, you know, precision's developed and pursued in order to get a functional return on it. And I think that's the case with things like the boxes and the vases. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think that they were just made that precisely for any other reason other than function. It's one of the main things that leads me to believe that I think these things had a function that they were later inherited and, you know, used ceremonially and in ritual and symbolic um, circumstances by the dynastic Egyptians. Yeah, no shit they had a function. No shit it was made precise to have a function. That's, I mean, that's very, very, like, you know, evident that I... It, it's precise. It's very precise objects. We have to look at the context that it was found in. Why does it have to have this high function that is on par with, you know, sending electricity around the world? Why does it have to be that crazy? To Ben, it doesn't seem like it can make sense that these objects exist if it didn't serve some sort of purpose that isn't ceremonial. Which is weird, because like, I mean, that is super important to people. You know, life, death, the afterlife. It, so it's super important to people and it was super important to people back then. How is that the part that you can't accept, that, that you take out? You know, I, I don't understand. It. I understand that, you know, he loves precision. He, you know, that's his area. And I can also understand that, you know, they definitely had technology that we don't know about anymore. But why does it have to be on that scale? You know, sending fucking internet under the ocean through cables. Why does it have to be on that scale? Why couldn't it just be super super precise for their functional purpose not our functional purpose and not any functional purpose that we know about but you can't stray so far away from the fence to where the contextual clues don't even matter anymore the probably the easiest way to understand it is when you think about you know flat surfaces or square corners but that's by no means the only uh, elements of precision although we certainly see those in ancient egypt you can see chris dunn here standing inside one of the serapium boxes using a precision square to measure the accuracy of the you know the, the corner between the lid again i am really not the biggest supporter of chris dunn that's probably the nicest way of saying that i just don't trust his methods i don't you know trust that he is not intellectually honest at times and uh, yeah i will be doing a full breakdown of the ancient presence podcast featuring Pip. Again, link to that podcast will be in the description down below. You know, another aspect of precision really is symmetry. And we see this in a lot of the statues. Like it's certainly been documented in the statues and headjets by Christopher Dunn. Uh, one of my favorite photos, I've used this one a lot, is up here. It's the reverse transparency overlay of the so-called Ramsey's head um, that was at, for a long time on the ground at, at Luxor Temple. Today, it's 30 feet up in the air on top of a reconstructed statue. So you can't really get a close look at it, unfortunately. 
But what Chris did was take a really a photo of it dead straight on. So really take the time to align this thing and make sure it's dead straight on, on the center line of the face. You take that photo, you copy it, you make them both 50% transparent. You take one of them and you flip it on that vertical axis and then you overlay them. And that allows you to really look at, okay, you now you're basically laying the left side on the right and vice versa. And it lets you determine, is there any inaccuracies left to right? You can see there's two Chris Dunn's in this photo on either side. And it shows that this face is just remarkably symmetrical. And that's been backed up by further analysis of these heads. Human faces aren't symmetrical. We have different sized nostrils and eyeballs. So to see it in these types of artifacts and to see particularly in stuff like granite that's that's of a size like this it's really something that isn't an accident uh it has to have been designed and created that way and i think it was done on purpose in fact it, it speaks a little bit to the design of the artifact in my mind i mean one of the efficient ways of potentially designing this if you assume maybe it was designed uh on a on software or on some form of computer that you could design half the face and then mirror it and you know, you've got the uh, you've got the other half of the face there, and then this gets executed in some manufacturing system. Do you see where I'm coming from? It's designed on software, eight gigabytes of RAM. No, that eight gigabytes of RAM is probably too little. They probably need like sixteen to export the file. So he says, obviously, it was designed and created. One hundred percent, we can see it was obviously designed and created. But then he mentions, you know, software. He mentions, you know, sending it off to be put on, you know, mechanical line indicating automation. I don't dispute automation. Okay, but the software part, look, I don't dispute. Look, we don't know what we don't know, right? So I don't dispute that there was some, there was some sort of crazy shit, you know, that we just don't know about. Like, you know, the way that they carve stones. But come on, software, like fucking designing it on the software and then sending it off onto the manufacturer line like come on bro i'm just saying like let's be realistic here i see what he's saying it's super precise it's super precise it's good like it's good as craftsmanship crazy good i can't give it enough i cannot like even state how crazy it is but gpus fucking 18 gigabyte ram stick software word xl like Bro, like, do you see where I'm coming from? Or am, or am I dumb? Like, am I the ignorant one? That shit. There's a lot more that, that is indicative of intelligent design uh, in these artifacts. In particular, this has been shown recently in the Vase Scan project. I'm barely going to touch on this topic right here because the Duncan already made, like, a crazy, like, good video about, you know, Uncharted X and the whole Vase project. So... I definitely recommend uh, you watch that video. I will leave a link to it in the description down below. But he discovered something called the radial traversal pattern in these vessels, in these vases. He, so it's it's truly unfathomable. It's remarkable, uh, as as you know, as as Mark says in his artifact that you know consistent microscopic precision implemented across t twelve different radii with fixed ratios in granite is an unfathomable achievement. Basically, we don't know what the fuck is going on, but also basically. A lot of complicated shit's happening. Go watch the Duncan video. I can't recommend it more. But yeah, these vases are really, really something else, bro. They really come from like an alien world, you know. But but that's what makes it crazy because it was found in this specific time period, um, confirmed to be like at least the specific amount of years old. So, so yeah, these vases are just crazy artifacts. They're really, really cool. Go watch the Duncan's video if you like. Really, just want the full rundown of this shit. What's even more interesting about this, and this was the thing that really sealed the deal for me, uh, is that we find it in multiple vases. We find the exact same radial traversal pattern, the same fixed ratio uh, in multiple vases. So if we find these same ratios right in the vases, I get that. Yeah, I get that. Why are there no two vases that are the same? If Ben's old theory about you know software and production lines are, are true, why are no two vases the same? I'm pretty sure that was said. I'm pretty sure I heard that said. Um, literally by the guy that was on Daniel Jones' podcast that, that owns like over 40 vases or some shit. Uh, you should also watch that podcast. Uh, super interesting. Yeah, why are no two vases the same? So maintaining that degree of precision on surfaces and faces relative to each other, this, this proportion of scale, 
is an absolutely an aspect of precision on these artifacts and it's one that is always ignored by the skeptics and the people that say all oh, these were always done by hand yeah these vases and its significance it's like you barely hear about um besides these videos so yeah that's unfortunate that its magnificence isn't pushed more uh, in the mainstream as you know people would call it but i don't know it is what it is it is out there you've got to remember that the dynastic egyptians particularly in the early period and part of their civilization i mean and we know that there were very large artifacts moved during the old kingdom or certainly they're attributed to the old kingdom and there's a 450 ton block on the Giza plateau for example and that's part of the old kingdom you've got obelisks and um um you know columns weighing hundreds of tons uh, that come to us from from that period of time they didn't use the wheel they didn't use animals we we know what they did because they showed us they drew it on the wall they used sleds and ropes and human horsepower and wooden levers there was no force multipliers there was no pulleys so he's taking that from the timeline to prove his point right that they didn't have all these instruments to move you know these objects now what if they did right what if we just don't know the methods that they use why does it seem like the only um and this isn't a bad thing why does it seem in ben's mind like the only explanation is like some crazy like fucking super technological or like fucking super magical uh thing why does it like have to be that both sides don't know things but we have contextual evidence things that we found in the ground that relate to in some way the story of that region so i mean that you can piece together so we don't know what we don't know now ben is acting just like an egyptologist here this is the great arm of a huge statue that's found at Karnak Temple, which is in Luxor. And, you know, what, there's a couple of things to note about this arm. In fact, the funny thing is, is that it was only one brief period where it was assembled like this. I've, I've visited Karnak many times. And all you generally see these days is just the hand. You see this giant thumb and hand, and you can see it at the end here next to Yusuf. And it was only for a short period where they'd, in this big boneyard of all these thousands and thousands of pieces, where they'd finally been looking through it and putting together parts of this statue. This statue was shattered. It was a single piece statue, but they put the arm together and then they took it away and, and they put it all, they, they moved it all away again. I was like, ask Yusuf, why, why did they do that? And he goes, because they don't want people asking questions. Bro, of course, Yusuf Awayan's going to tell you that, though. They definitely people trying to find the truth, but doing it in a way that is going to make the most money possible and they've definitely found out what what works and what doesn't so that's why i say of course yusuf awayan is going to say that a lot of people ask where are the tools and whatever why don't we find more metal it's because it's precious and it was it was sought after and it was used and you could take pretty much all of the metal that's been found across all of ancient egypt and pit, fit it into a pretty small room not counting gold and silver i mean they, they found literally hundreds and hundreds of kilograms of that stuff it's useless as a tool it's decorative obviously has its value but it's not useful as a tool but you know things like bronze copper steel iron all very useful as tools they showed us how they did things they drew scenes on the wall right they're using hand tools they're pouring mud they're making mud bricks in this scene is what they do they're cooking stuff over a fire they're hardening up mud bricks and this is a scene of them basically making mud bricks to make mud brick ramps but one thing you you can obviously see from this is that it's human horsepower it's manual labor it's nothing super sophisticated ben's idea of sophisticated seems to be dull monitors power supplies and hp laptops like the meaning of the word changes based on the context that you're using it in i might be wrong there i'm trying to say something if i said what i'm trying to say wrong uh you feel free to correct me in the comments but yeah but i'm trying to say something before you get on my meat in the comments pause I see what he's saying. We don't have evidence for what this indicates. But what if we just don't have evidence for what that indicates? But, I mean, it's there, right? I feel like what he's claiming requires so much more evidence that he doesn't have. And I can't connect to that theory because he doesn't have enough evidence. I feel like he'd argue that it makes no sense to ask for you know those types of tools because you know things have been melted down and he does touch on that later in the video but what i'm arguing is maybe we just don't have the evidence for how they did it they did it we don't know how but they did it we and they clearly didn't inscribe a lot of hieroglyphs that talks about construction but i'm going to go into theory mode and say that maybe there was you know just like benny's saying hidden technology 
that they had. Hidden methods, hidden techniques um, that the stone crafters were using at the time. So maybe it's like don't inscribe that, don't spread this information. Um, but another theory is that the information was just lost over time. But another theory is that the information was just lost over time. But based on so much contextual evidence that we have on the Egyptians, I can't come to the conclusion that a lot of these structures were created by, you know, people, you know, over 10,000 years ago with computer softwares and manufacturer lines. I just can't go that far. Like I always say, the contextual evidence doesn't allow me to, to stretch that far. So I'm so sorry if you have made it this far. I really, really appreciate it. But I have to end up splitting this video up into two parts because it just ended up being so long. So if you did enjoy this video and would like to see a next part, I would appreciate a like on this video. It lets me know that you enjoyed it. I'm still going to upload the next part anyway. But in case you are interested, you can also subscribe and you can turn on the notification bell and then you'll get notified as soon as that video comes out. It's going to be coming out within the next one to two days. And then I also want to get the video out with Christopher Dunn and Ancient Presence, that whole podcast. It was like weirdly entertaining, but also just weirdly Christopher Dunn was being intellectually dishonest. I uh, wasn't a super fan of his character in that podcast. But yeah, all that and more coming soon. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I'm going to put this up on the screen. If you are part of this 98.6% or 98.8% and you want to make the number smaller, I'd appreciate that. But yeah, watch out for part two. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good rest of your day.